Welcome to a fantastic edition of Rebellion's Educational Series. We have a national treasure with us, NASA astronaut J.D. Weatherby, the only American to command five shuttle missions. Astronaut Weatherby, thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, my pleasure. It's a great honor to be here with you. Oh, no, the pleasure is all ours. So you told me before you came on that you have a rational fear of heights, which absolutely just, I'm, I'm still getting over that. How did you sit in that shuttle five times, command missions while you were couldn't even look down almost? Uh, well, when I say a rational fear of heights, it isn't really a fear of heights, it's a fear of falling. And even then it's a fear of the impact after falling. So I just make sure I don't fall. I love it. So that brings me to your book, Controlling Risk in a Dangerous World. To make sure you don't fall, obviously you wrote this book about living life in a risk averse way, but every one of your missions had so much inherent risk in it. You know, I, I guess you became a master of analyzing risk. Exactly. When I was 10 years old, I decided I was going to be an astronaut. I don't remember much before I was 10 years old. But was there a particular like, catalyst that made you turn? It, I think it was probably the Mercury missions that were going off and I was paying attention, but it was more about some internal circuit breaker in my mind suddenly engaged and I realized there's a world out there, I can be part of it, what do I wanna do? And I, and I decided not that I wanted to be an astronaut, I was going to be an astronaut. You know, when you're young, you think like that. As I got older, I realized not much chance, but I'll do the next step along that journey and and when i so i studied aerospace engineering in college went to the university of notre dame when i graduated i didn't want to get a real job so i decided to join the u.s navy to learn how to fly i thought that would be spectacular and it was flying on aircraft carriers best job on the planet you made 150 160 night uh landings i also read yes yeah, uh, i think it was about 125 345 in the uh, total arrested landings. Uh, they're incredibly fun, exhilarating. Um, but I began to, as, as a naval aviator, I began to think, how can I fly more missions? And certainly one thing you must do is stay alive on this mission to be able to fly another mission. And that was my goal was to fly as many missions as I could. So I really had to flying a single seat airplane, I had to learn how to prevent, predict and prevent all accidents, even ones that are maybe unpredictable. And so I began a journey at a very early age of trying to figure out how am I going to stay alive? So to stay alive, you wanted to essentially test the mechanism as much as possible so that it was something you just had an innate understanding for? Yes, and, and, and I also began to realize as I entered the world, most organizations and most people talk about managing risk. You know, and it's a valuable concept, but I kept thinking, no, I'm really, I really need to control the risk. I need to do everything I can to make sure this accident does not happen. And there's subtle but very important distinctions between managing risk and controlling risk, and that began my journey. Astronaut Weatherby, you flew uh, F-18s, right, for the on the carriers? I, I flew the A-7 Corsair on the aircraft carriers when I became a test pilot. One of my jobs was to test the F-18, which was new at the time. Uh, okay. It had significant deficiencies that we had to identify to correct before we issued the airplane to the fleet for regular pilots. Well, what about accounting for like a, a sudden gust of wind, you know, which, uh, you know, you know, significant wind can cause many flights to go down. I mean, how, you know, how do you account for something like that? It, these days, and airplanes are mostly fly by wire. And so the pilot makes a control input to, for example, counter turbulence or gusts of wind, but it's really the computer that figures out how do I move the actuators, the, the aerodynamic surfaces to counter the gust of wind, even wind or turbulence that the pilot doesn't sense, the computer will sense it. And uh, you'll, you'll know from your background in-, in uh, But what about on the Corsair? Um, we had augmentation. We didn't have control 
uh, uh, computer control input. So we had augmentation. So I, I feel like I trained in the best of all worlds where I had to learn how to control the airplane and respond to those gusts of winds without the computer assist, uh, which, which gives us a big uh, advantage over the young people this day and age where, where everything is done by computers. It, it, you're really training your brain to be a computer and to respond to the gusts and turbulence in the automatic processing of your brain rather than just the controlled processing. So you take in the scene, you train your neurovestibular system to sense the gusts and the turbulence, and then your brain knows automatically how to respond with the control stick inputs. It's one of the beauties of being a human is we have this incredible machine up inside our heads that learns from programming that we call training. And even with, this is the really cool part, even the advantage we have over computers is even with incomplete training or programming, I can still accomplish tests. For example, yeah, I can land on any runway in the world without ever seeing every runway in the world because I have training to land on runways in That's general. Right, uh, computers don't have that. Maybe in the future, they'll have that ability. But with the shuttle, did you have the comfort after five missions that you had, you know, after hundreds of missions with the Corsair, or was it just not, you know, comparable in terms of comfort with the ship? Uh, it's definitely comparable. It's almost identical landing on an aircraft carrier uh, where you're seconds away from death if you make a mistake. It's almost identical landing in a space shuttle where you have no fuel to go around if you make a mistake. It's a little bit harder in the space shuttle. It's almost like the analogy is like uh, taking an ocean liner into a dock. And if you make a mistake and crash into the dock, it's not a mistake you made in the last 10 seconds. It's a mistake you made a couple of minutes ago because of so much inertia. Same thing in the space shuttle. No, no. My, my first cousin, Flip Colmer, uh, unfortunately, uh, one of his Corsairs went off the aircraft carrier uh, when he was landing uh, off of the coast of Australia. So I know how firsthand from family how hard it is to land on an aircraft carrier. Yeah, it's quite challenging. Uh, I always felt in control. You know, you don't do that without sufficient training. Um, and, and actually, I did even more training than the organization required. When I first joined the Navy, I didn't have any flight experience. I looked at the syllabus and I thought the organization is not giving me enough training. So I became friends with the night shift janitor in the simulator building, and he would allow me to sneak into the building even at 1.30 in the morning, and I practiced surreptitiously in the simulator. Reminds me of astronaut Mattingly, who I hear was the most dedicated astronaut in terms of you know, work hours of all time. TK was great, uh, TK Mattingly. Uh, at, at one point before one of his shuttle missions, he was in the simulator and the instructors were, were trying to give him um, some really arcane minutia and and he suddenly stopped he was very close to the mission they had done so many sim, you know thousands of hours of simulations and he stopped and he said now wait a minute is this really important because for every bit that's going in this year one bit has fallen out so you better make sure what you're teaching me is important for this mission no oh, no it's uh that's a, a very cool tidbit i've got to ask did your flying the corsair prepare you for the g-shock when uh, you were on the shuttle, or was it just a, another level of? Yeah. yeah, so the acceleration is almost identical. When you're on a catapult launch from an aircraft carrier, it's about two Gs of acceleration. It's through the chest, and so you're pushed back into the seat. Uh, when you're on a space shuttle, it, it's almost identical. Now you're on your back and you're going straight up, but again, the acceleration is through your chest. The only difference is an A7 acceleration lasts about two seconds. The space shuttle launch and acceleration lasts about eight minutes and 23 seconds. And it also builds up to three Gs, pushing you pretty hard through the chest. Many astronauts in, in the beginning of the space shuttle program um, felt that they couldn't breathe. And they were, you know, if you ever deflate your lungs, it's very hard to reinflate them. So the technique was to 
get a big lung full of air and then just breathe using your diaphragm while leaving your chest expanded because the force would push on you so hard it felt like a bear sitting on your chest. In fact, I used to train with my daughters. I would lay down on the ground and my daughters would stand on my chest and I would practice breathing with all that weight on my chest. Wow, that's fascinating to, to know. And I know you also had to do tons of water training too. Was that uh, almost trial by water? <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, the, the best thing you can do is to stay calm and collected and don't, don't start freaking out. Don't let your wits uh, uh, take off. I also worked after as an astronaut in the oil and gas industry, and we also had very similar training that we had in the Navy. They would take us in a helicopter, a simula simulator and a helicopter into a pool turn the simulator upside down while you, with you still strapped in, submerged underwater. And the trick was to do nothing and count to seven and then very calmly unstrap the seat harness and extricate yourself. You always had to figure out which way was up because it can be very disorienting, but you could see which way the bubbles are going and then calmly exit the vehicle and swim to the surface. You just have to stay cool about it. No, staying cool is so important. Very hard to do, though. You were on the last shuttle before um, NASA's second disaster. Um, right, the Columbia accident, right? Yeah, so you know that, does that hold heavy with you? Um, so yes, I flew the last successful mission before Columbia. Interestingly, the flight before my mission, so two flights in front of Columbia, the same giant piece of foam came off and it hit the solid rocket booster so hard that it dented the metal. So before my flight, the engineers had to assess whether or not this could potentially be disastrous. They concluded um, that it would not be disastrous. They did nothing to change the system and they launched us in uh, late November of 2002. The question is, did that piece come off on our mission? Nobody knows because it was a night launch. They never asked the question again. And then the, the following flight was Columbia when it launched and the piece came off and it hit the leading edge of the wing and put a hole 16 inches in the leading edge of the wing. And of course the mission two weeks later was disastrous when the hot gas impacted and uh, in in the wing about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit and so the wing melted and came off. My job after that mission was I was the search director for the human remains of the Columbia crew. My job was to lead 2,000 people in 45 different organizations as we searched for and attempted to recover uh, the human remains of the Columbia crew with dignity, honor, and reverence. That was my mission statement to make sure that we uh, recovered the human remains. Um, that, when I think back on my career, I, I often think that is, uh, you know, I'm most proud of that tragic situation and the work that we did to recover the human remains of the Columbia crew. After that, I was assigned to the safety department responsible for helping to improve the safety culture at NASA. And I continued my journey of trying to figure out how do we really prevent these kinds of tragedies in the future. And do you feel it could have been prevented or was this one? Oh, absolutely. I, I feel that uh, I'm one of those guys that feels that all accidents can be prevented. We just have to know how to not only manage the risk, but to control the risk. And again, it's a subtle but important distinction. It really is. When you look at for instance, the Boeing 737 MAX, you have instances where, you know, airlines have these pilots that don't even really know how to turn off the system and fly the bird on its own. Yeah, yeah. So where we, where we go awry as a society and as companies is, so think about what happens after an accident. Typically there's an investigation team convened, they issue recommendations and what's promulgated are new rules and policies and procedures, which are very closed and not adaptive, very specific, do it this way operators, and you won't have an accident that's similar to one we've had in the past. The problem is that only helps you prevent accidents that are similar to ones that we know about. If you wanna prevent all accidents, we need to supplement the rules, policies, and procedures with something else. 
And that something else is what I call principles-based techniques. Here's a quick example to illustrate. If you're in your car, most organizations, most companies have a rule that specifies you cannot operate your cell phone, use your cell phone when you're driving a car on company time. So that's a rule. Don't use your cell phone when you're driving. You'll prevent a lot of accidents that way. But if you want to prevent all accidents in your motor vehicle, what's a better principle you can follow in addition to not using the cell phone? It turns out uh, some people get this when I ask this question, some don't. It turns out what you should do is try to identify and avoid all distractions in the car, not just the cell phone. Maybe it's the radio that you're listening to, the music on the radio, or maybe it's the conversation you're having, or maybe it's thinking about my arrogant boss and why did he yell at me yesterday or the meeting that I'm late for. If I can avoid, identify and avoid all distractions and pay attention, that's a principles-based technique that I can use to avoid all car accidents. And, and so far I've proven it in, you know, 47 years of driving, I've never had a car accident. Well, it's a very impressive record. I unfortunately have myself. So your book, Controlling Risk in a Dangerous World, it's ideal for anyone from an 18 year old to an 80 year old who just wants a, a better path for living life, safer path. Yes, uh, you know, and I was asked by my publisher, who's the target audience? And my initial answer was everybody. And they said, no, you have to be very specific. Oh, no. And I said, well, okay, it's, it's intended for people who are operating in dangerous environments or companies in dangerous environments. Well, it turns out that was my way of getting around it. That's all of us because all of us at some point are operating in a dangerous environment. So we need these techniques that will help us avoid and, and prevent all accidents and help us be more productive and, and generate more income for the company. You know, all the very things that the executives want is how do I improve the bottom line? Well, prevent all accidents and work with higher quality so you can be more productive. That's a very cool book and we recommend all of our readers check it out. Uh, this was a just Phenomenal conversation, National Brother BI. I couldn't be more thankful for it. Well, thank you very much for your interest. Today. I'd love to talk to you sometime in the future about your uh, your work in, in AI. That would be very interesting, I think. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Astronaut. Yeah, that would uh, be my honor. Well, you stay safe during these absolutely crazy times. Thank you very much.